Hello, this is Gina Piscatelli with the last lecture on the immune system for students taking Anatomy and Physiology 2 at Madison College. This picture that you're looking at um, is uh, a T cell, a cytotoxic T cell killing a cancer cell. And the cancer cell is yellow and the cytotoxic T cell is blue or purple. It really is a better picture for the last lecture on cell mediated immunity but um, I found it and I liked it so I thought I would put it up here for you it's magnified 2100 times so it's pretty pretty small stuff happening in the body so in this lecture we're going to talk about applied immuno immunology and immune system disorders and I'll start with applied immunology um, here are two examples of research in immunology that led to our modern technique of vaccination. So on the left, we see a picture of a rabbit receiving an injection. And originally there was a rabbit given a bacterial molecule of some sort, and that rabbit made antibodies. Then those antibodies were harvested from its serum and used to immunize other animals like the one you see in this picture. This was done in 1916. So already antibodies were thought of and conceived of. Maybe they didn't know, you know, genes and, well, they didn't because DNA was discovered later, but they didn't know exactly what caused the production of antibodies. But even earlier than that, in um, 1881, Louis Pasteur recognized that if a bacteria was cultured and somehow weakened, I'm not sure how they did that, we call weakening an infectious agent attenuation. But anyway, if this bacteria was weakened and then prepared in a way that could be used to inoculate sheep, the sheep were then protected against infection by the same bacteria if they were exposed again to the same bacteria. So these two examples um, led to further research, of course, that helped us devise the technique for vaccinations. The case of the rabbit receiving antibodies from another animal or another animal that made the antibodies is now referred to as passive immunity. Whereas the case with the sheep, in which the sheep was actually given a weakened but pathogenic microorganism, the sheep made its own antibodies. So that's called um, active immunity. So I've introduced the types of immunity, at least the two basic types, active versus passive. In active immunity, antibodies are produced by the body's own immune system. In passive immunity, a person receives antibodies that were made by another individual. But either of these basic types could be acquired, the antibodies could be acquired naturally or artificially. And you might not believe that with passive immunity, but I'll explain further. With active immunity, a person makes their own antibodies. We know this. And this may happen when they are naturally exposed to a pathogen, like some kind of a virus, or it may happen artificially after they've been given a vaccination. And a vaccination, which I'll discuss a little bit further later, is a pathogen that's been weakened or attenuated. With passive immunity, antibodies given to a person who didn't make them, usually given through an IV, uh, we usually think of those as being artificial. Like when one person's blood is harvested and the antibodies isolated and then injected with the IV. But it also happens naturally. So passive immunity can happen naturally when antibodies pass from a mother to her fetus through the placenta. It also occurs when a baby drinks the breast milk from its mother 
and the breast milk contains antibodies. Okay, let's talk about uh, artificial active immunity through vaccination. The definition of a vaccination is call, is introducing an attenuated infectious agent. Attenuated means the agent's either dead, inactive, or weakened in some fashion. So when this infectious agent, but weakened, is given, it can't cause symptoms or reproduce in our body. But our immune system responds, and therefore we're talking about artificial active immunity at work. With all adaptive immune responses, the effectiveness of immunity is always dependent on a person's ability to respond to this prior microorganism by having the lymphocytes become activated so much more quicker than the microorganism can divide. If the microorganism divides so quickly that it overwhelms the body's defenses, then a person will get sick. But with vaccinations, you have memory cells, and those memory cells activate quickly. And so the real power of vaccination is the formation of memory cells, both B memory cells and T memory cells. So this brings up the concept of herd immunity. Because vaccinations, although really important to the individuals that receive them, are also important to individuals who can't receive a vaccination due to having a compromised or underdeveloped immune system. So vaccinations offer protection to a community as well as to an individual, which is often referred to as herd immunity, because remember this work with vaccinations was first used in animal herds. Now that we're talking about people or human communities, we might better call it community immunity, which rhymes, which is kind of nice. But this involves a situation when a su sufficient proportion of a population is immune to an infectious disease through vaccination. It could be due to prior illness, but that's very, very, very rare. So the fact that so many people are vaccinated makes the spread from person to person unlikely. And therefore, individuals not vaccinated, such as newborns, those with chronic illnesses, are often um, given some protection because the disease has little opportunity to spread within the community and they're less likely to be exposed. So this image shows what happens if only a small proportion of a community are vaccinated. <clears throat> the vaccinated individuals are shown in this picture with smiles. They're yellow and there's three of them. So these are the vaccinated individuals. The other yellow individuals don't, that don't have smiles, they're healthy, okay, but they don't have vaccines. The green one, got sick, unlucky enough to be exposed to some sort of pathogen and got sick. But because few individuals were vaccinated, this sick person, through coughing, sneezing, touching, whatever, the disease spread to almost all of the unvaccinated individuals. There's one lucky person here who didn't get vaccinated, but didn't come into contact with the pathogen. It didn't spread to them, but it spread to most of the population, which you can see by the number of green individuals there. But in contrast, this picture shows how spread can be contained when most individuals are vaccinated. So we have a population here with several individuals that have all been vaccinated. There's eight of them, I guess but um, three have not been, right? And again, one unlucky person gets sick, 
Presumably they were not vaccinated. But the sick person, when coughing, sneezing, spreading the disease like a normal individual would, um, if they're out and about, the vaccinated people were protected. And we see that very few actually acquired the, the disease through exposure. And, and that's because those that were vaccinated, even if they were exposed, were able to mount an immune response. And therefore, they didn't get sick. And the microorganism presumably died in their body, and they couldn't spread the disease. So that's a little bit about uh, applied immunology and how it relates to even our current day situation with COVID. Now let's look at some immune disorders. I'll briefly talk about organ transplants and rejection, the means by which um, organs that are transplanted can be rejected by a person's immune systems, a person's immune system. And then I'll talk about immunodeficiencies versus autoimmune diseases. And then finally, hypersensitive, hypersensitivities. So starting with organ transplants. Transplanted tissues from one individual to another of the same species is called an allograft. Allo means same. And a rejection can occur, even though it's from the same um, species, due to a person's natural killer cells, their macrophages, antibodies, and T cells. So to help minimize rejection of this transplanted organ, even if it's just blood, it's important to match the donor and recipient as closely as possible in terms of the major histocompatibility complexes, MHCs 1 and 2. You'll never get an exact match, but the closer the better. And also it's important when you're doing uh, transplanting blood to make sure that the ABO antigens as well as the RH factor antigen uh, matches up between the donor and the recipient. Now with organ transplants, it is possible to give immunosuppressive therapy like corticosteroids and other things, and that will help prevent lymphocytes from dividing so rapidly, but it will also, in some cases, depends on the treatment, will kill any rapidly dividing cells. So it suppresses the immune system. And the problem with that is that it then allows other opportunistic infections to occur. So if you've suppressed the immune system, um, then you have a problem. For example, I know an individual who received a kidney transplant and um, eventually that kidney failed and he had to go back on dialysis. But um, what actually ended up causing his death were all these opportunistic infections and cancer because the natural killer cells were suppressed. It's sad. Okay, let's talk about immunodeficiencies now. Immunodeficiencies might be congenital, that is a genetic defect that you're born with, or it could be acquired. So an immunodeficiency, an example of an immunodeficiency that is genetic or congenital is severe combined immunodeficiency syndrome, SCIDS. I understand now SCIDS is not considered one particular syndrome. There's many, but originally it was identified as just one disorder. So I'm going to talk about SCIDS first and then we'll come back to the acquired example of an immunodeficiency. So in SCIDS, an individual's bone marrow does not develop B and T lymphocytes adequately. So there's a deficiency of adaptive immunity. And without adaptive immunity, intervention must be taken quickly within the first month of life. If untreated, the disease is fatal. Now, I'm not a clinician, so I hate to say something so severe as 
intervention must begin within the first month of life because we do know there are treatments now like transplantation of bone marrow, hematopoietic stem cells. If you're interested in further information regarding SCIDS, I recommend watching this video here. Um, it's David Vetter, the boy in the bubble. Um, he was born with skids and kept in a protective environment, including, you know, living inside of a plastic sort of space. And when he left, he had this uh, space suit developed by NASA. Um, and it, it tells the story of, of what they went through, the family and the boy. Beware, it's, it's pretty moving and heart-wrenching because he just lived for 12 years. Um, he eventually was given an unsuccessful bone marrow transplant, and I think that procedure just finally kind of wiped him out, I think. Okay, let's go to immunodeficiency examples that are acquired, something you're not necessarily born with. One example I've already mentioned, and that is when you're given immunosuppressive therapy for one reason or another, you can even do it with autoimmune disorders or transplant. <clears throat> but the more familiar example of an acquired immunodeficiency is AIDS. So this is a disease known as acquired immune deficiency syndrome. This disease is caused by HIV. It's different than SCIDS in many ways. Obviously, one of which is that the disease is acquired, hence its name. The other is that there's more treatment now um, for HIV and AIDS. So it's important to distinguish between HIV and AIDS. HIV which is an abbreviation for human immunodeficiency virus, is actually the pathogen. It causes a disease, but one could be HIV positive and not have the disease. The disease or syndrome is acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. And this involves severe depression of the immune response. You have to be infected with HIV to acquire this syndrome. <clears throat> so this is a picture of HIV, which was on the previous slide as well. Uh, it has this yellow capsule with some uh, glycoproteins and proteins on the cell surface. But what's most important is what's on the inside of the virus. The virus contains RNA. And here we've got two different strands of RNA. And it looks like there might be some enzyme there called reverse transcriptase. So the virus is called a retrovirus because it contains RNA that can be translated into DNA. It doesn't mean the RNA is converted. It means the code in the RNA is used by this enzyme, reverse transcriptase, to make a DNA code. And then the DNA codes for proteins that um, are able to insert in the host's DNA. I'm sorry, I didn't say that right. The DNA can insert into the host's DNA. And then as the host begins transcribing the DNA, that cell begins producing more viral proteins. And new copies of the virus are made and eventually leave the host cell. And when the virus bursts from the host cell, the host cell dies. So the, eventually the host cell ruptures 
because of the release of so many copies of the new virus. So I just want to say that one more time because I'm afraid that I messed up a little bit in my wording. So the retrovirus contains RNA and an enzyme that inside the host cell works to translate RNA with the use of the host's and uh, ribosomes into DNA. And then this DNA inserts into the host's genome. And now the host cell has these viral genes in the form of DNA that it transcribes. And those genes code for viral proteins. And the viral proteins, including some that assemble as the whole copies of the virus, burst or rupture from the host cell and destroy the host cell. So that's bad enough. That's how all retroviruses work, not just HIV. But what's particularly terrible about HIV and the reason that it's so virulent is because it binds, this is the virus, it binds to helper T cells and infects them. So this capsid protein out here can bind to the T cell receptor and that enables the virus to insert its RNA inside the helper T cells. So now the helper T cell is going to get destroyed because eventually it's going to make more virus cell, viruses and viral proteins and burst. And so what we see is from a normal helper T cell count of 600 to 1200, which is quite the range, cells per microliter, in a patient who <clears throat> has age has AIDS, there's less than 200 helper T cells per microliter. So a fifth a third to a, a sixth, I guess. And so it drastically reduces the number of helper T cells. Now, what are the consequences of having an HIV infection? Let's start there. First, there might not be any signs or symptoms, but a little bit later, it'll be kind of like any virus, I guess, flu-like symptoms. Not that I'm trying to scare you because again, I'm not a clinician, okay? But progression occurs over months to years, and you get such a decrease in helper T cells that you see um, inflammation of the lymph nodes, but the biggest problem is opportunistic infections. Cancer is a big one, and it can lead to death. Now, we do know that there are treatments now for disease, okay? Okay. Um, and we also know the modes that this virus is transmitted, usually by blood or placenta, semen, vaginal fluid. Casual contact, you know, skin to skin, it's essentially zero. So the reason it's so harmful and the reason that um, opportunistic infections occur is because it targets specifically these helper T cells that influence every branch of the immune system. So initially, it might have infected a macrophage, for example, but then eventually the helper T cell recognizes um, a macrophage that's like displaying a viral particle. And so the helper T cell gets infected and the helper T cells don't work properly. And if they don't work properly, then cell-mediated immunity doesn't work properly. And remember that helper T cells actually facilitate the production of B cell clones that would be specific for that viral particle. So without helper T cells, there's no amplification of antibody-mediated. You still might make some antibodies against it, but you, you won't be doing any killing, really. And the helper T cells, you might remember, also help influence and enhance nonspecific resistance by attracting neutrophils, macrophages, causing basophils to uh, release histamine. And 
So you basically lose both nonspecific resistance and specific adaptive immunity. And that's what causes an individual who's infected to become more susceptible to any type of abnormal cell, including infection or cancer. So here's an example of a patient that um, was HIV positive and developed what's known as Kaposi's sarcoma. It's really a rare cancer that forms in blood vessels and you get these bruise-like lesions on the skin. Um, that's really common in AIDS patients because the dendritic cells aren't activated and the macrophages aren't. There's other examples of opportunistic infections. Um, toxoplasmosis would become much more, not that it doesn't occur in other individuals, but it would become much more serious. Pneumocystitis, tuberculosis, herpes simplex virus, and yeast infections, because we normally have endogenous yeast, um, candida albicans, present, um, particularly females in the vaginal tract, but um, they're kept in check by the immune system as well as other competitive microorganisms. And without the immune system, these um, microorganisms can take hold and cause very serious disease. Okay, so that was immunodeficiencies. Now let's talk about autoimmune diseases. So in this case, it's not a reduced number of cells that's the problem. In this case, the immune system has the cells, but the cells and the antibodies lose their ability to distinguish between self and non-self. So in this case, antibodies mark the body's own cells as well as phagocytes and cytotoxic T cells, but those cells destroy tissues. So the phagocytes will destroy any cell that has antibodies on it. Cytotoxic T cells will do the same thing. So examples of autoimmune diseases that you've probably heard of include rheumatoid arthritis in which joints are um, degraded. I don't know if destruction is the right word. Another example is multiple sclerosis in which the myelin in the central nervous system is destroyed over time. My sister-in-law has MS, but she's doing very, very, very well. And then type 1 diabetes in which pancreatic beta cells are destroyed and so insulin is not made. So those are some examples of autoimmune disorders. The last disorder that we'll talk about are hypersensitivities. And these are very different than autoimmune diseases or immunodeficiencies. Uh, inflammation may occur and inflict damage on body tissues, but generally hypersensi hypersensitivities are treatable. They pose a threat though, when the respiratory system is affected, like with asthma, for example. Um, and I'm sure that there's so much more known now about the damage that hypersensitivity reactions cause than I'm aware of to date, that they might be much more serious than I think. But generally speaking, hypersensitivities are often treatable. The immune system usually perceives a threat that actually is harmless. But once that immune system is activated, you know that cells are going to be killed and so tissues are going to be damaged. And different hypersensitivities will activate uh, the antibody-mediated immune system and others will activate the um, cell-mediated immune system. So let's look at type 1 hypersensitivities because these are the ones that people are usually the most familiar with because we call them allergies. Type 1 hypersensitivities have, they range in severity, but usually once you're exposed to 
the allergen or the harmless agent that actually causes you harm. You get an immediate reaction, can be severe, and the reaction begins within seconds after contact. But it's usually short. It only lasts like 30 minutes. And what happens is IgE antibodies um, are produced by plasma cells. Once the plasma cells have been stimulated by recognition of the allergen, and those IgE antibodies then go on to stimulate mast cells and basophils, which causes vasodilation and inflammation. <clears throat> Other antibody mediated hypersensitivities are referred to as subacute, subacute versus acute, because they have a slower onset, but they do last longer than type 1. And so it probably varies from allergen to allergen, and I don't even know if we want to call it an allergen, but what happens in this case is that um, IgG and IgM antibodies are produced in great quantities and they activate complement which causes cell lysis and activates neutrophils um, which are activate neutrophils which then can perform phagocytosis. My understanding of subacute hypersensitivities is that although the symptoms may actually be less severe the recurrence and chronic nature of subacute hypersensitivities might actually cause more permanent impairment and further disease than type 1. And primarily that's because type 1 hypersensitivities are recognized pretty quickly because the reaction is immediate and severe and so treatable, or at least treated. So this is the mechanism of a type 1 hypersensitivity. You first have a sensitization stage where the antigen is introduced into the body. And first you know there's a, a B cell, a regular old B cell that recognizes the antigen. And then that B cell is cloned and a plasma cell is created. And so these plasma cells can be like memory cells too and they produce vast numbers of IgE. Now the IgE antibodies can attach to mast cells in the, in the body tissues. Now so far so good, all we have are uh, mast cells and basophils ready to release histamine. But it's not until the secondary response that we see huge histamine release. So with secondary exposure with the same antigen, now the antigen binds to the antibodies that are on the mast cell or the basophil. And now the mast cell or the basophil releases histamine. And what you get are blood vessels dilating, which promotes edema, and lots of mucus production. <clears throat> and if the respiratory system is the site where the antigen originally entered the body, you can have smooth muscle impairment. And so the smooth muscle, oh, sorry, it's this picture. The smooth muscle might actually contract and therefore constrict your airways. So that would cause asthma and that would be terrible. Now those are all antibody mediated hypersensitivities. Uh, a cell mediated hypersensitivity that involves T lymphocytes are usually much more delayed. They appear, the symptoms appear after one to three days of exposure. And uh, again, we've learned ways to treat these by suppressing the immune system with like corticosteroids, but examples would include dermatitis, you know, caused by poison ivy or some metals, maybe cosmetics, chemicals and deodorants. You will get inflammation and tissue damage 
due to the fact that macrophages will be activated and so will cytotoxic T cells. But um, usually it's local and not widespread throughout the bloodstream. And so uh, much more treatable. Okay, that's the last of the immune system. Thank you very much for listening.